Good morning, church. Can you hear me? Is microphone working? Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning again, church. Welcome this morning. I see some guests this morning and welcome you too. Next Sunday is our church's centennial anniversary. 100 years is a long time. And praise and thanks to the Lord for the wonderful days has gone past and even more wonderful days are to come. When people ask me which church I go to and I say Greenslope Baptist Church, their first response is, oh, that church prays a lot. So undoubtedly, praying church has been one of our church's strongest identity and its tradition continues. And that means there are many praying people in this church. Praise the Lord. The passage today is Luke 11, verse 1 to 13, which contains a parable of Jesus. We are doing a series of Jesus' parable. In today's passage, Jesus first gives us what to pray, then he reveals Father's heart towards his people who prays. So I believe God wants to strengthen our faith on you today as we are facing our 100 years anniversary next week. So I'm going, I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Abba Father, I pray that you would speak each and every one of us today how much you care about us and how much you love us. Help us to receive your heart so we can advance your kingdom for the next 100 years with prayer. Father, give us strength, courage, and hope to continue pray as we focus on to your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples came and said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus said to them, when you pray, say this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who indebted to us. And do not lead us into the temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. After Jesus taught this prayer, known as the Lord's Prayer, he gave the disciple this parable. <coughs> but first, I would like to explain some cultural aspect of the Middle East in the first century so we can understand the parable better. First, hospitality to a visiting friend, even to a stranger, was considered as a sacred duty. It was not merely a matter of good manners, but a moral foundation which grew out of a harsh desert and nomadism. A visitor had to be welcomed and cared for regardless of the arrival time, and there was no motel and hotel system as in the modern world. Second, a visitor arriving at someone's house was, the, uh, was not only a visitor of his house, but also a visitor of the whole village. So everyone in the village was bound to help the host to serve the guest. Uh, host could call on other people for help, and as long as the request was reasonable, the rejection was unthinkable. And women said the women in the village used a community oven to bake bread, according to a, some sort of rasta. So everyone in the village knew who had freshly baked bread that day. Breads were small rolls, 
and three of them were adequate for one person's meal. So there were no 24-hour fast food restaurant in that days. So considering these cultural background, let's go to the parable. I am going to paraphrase. Jesus says, suppose you are living in a first century uh, village in Galilee. One night, when it was close to midnight, suppose your friends arrive from a distant village, but you have no bread to offer the guest. Unexpected guest arrived in unexpected time, and that time was very inconvenient. You know which neighbor has bread, but it is midnight, too late. So the neighbor and his whole family must have already gone to sleep. Would you have the nerve to go wake him up and possibly his whole family? Suppose you have the guts to do so. So you run to the neighbor's house and knock on the door saying, please give me the bread. Give me three loaves of bread. My friend just arrived and I have no bread. Then you hear your neighbor from inside saying, don't bother me. My friend and I are all in bed already. Stop knocking and go away. I mean, it may be the natural response considering the time which was close to midnight. What would you do? Would you go back empty-handed? Or would you keep on being bold? Suppose, let's suppose that you decided to be shameless. I'm just going to check the, okay. Yep, that's the part. And verse eight, Jesus says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because, you, because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. I think Jesus implies in this parable, firstly, just like an unexpected guest arrive in uncomfortable time as in the parable, a crisis or a problem can happen to you when you are least expected. And as God's people, you are to bring your need to him. Nothing is too big and nothing is too small for God. So bring it on. As also of Hebrews said, we are to appro approach the God's throne of grace with confidence. So we may find the word mercy, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Secondly, Jesus implies this, be bold when you don't receive a positive answer for the first time. Even be shamelessly bold in your approach, he says. Your heavenly father will respond to you for his own namesake. This one is a bit of explanation. It's about shameless audacity. The Greek word anadian for shameless audacity comes from the root word anadia. This Greek term is very difficult to render in English. It combines two quality, boldness and shamelessness. And it, it implies no shame for both parties in this parable. When Jesus said, the neighbor will surely get up and give you the bread because of your anadian, it means if the neighbor doesn't, it'll be a shame on him. In other words, everyone in, in the village will eventually find out that he brought disgrace to the whole village because he didn't bother getting up. The word anadian also implies 
that the host carries no shame in what he is doing. So consider, considering the cultural background we just went through, he was doing the right thing. So the host is audacious, but no shame. So when I say to you, God is a loving father, and he, he wants to give you whatever you ask him, and he is ready to hear and answer you, that is absolutely true. That's what God does for us. 1 Samuel chapter 12, 22 says, For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, but because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. Psalm 23, verse 3 says, He guides me along the right paths, paths for his name's sake. And Psalm 106, verse 8 says, Yet he saved them for his name's sake to make his mighty power known. So God does not reject us for his namesake. God guides us and saves us for his namesake, simply because we are his children. Then some people might wonder, then will God do anything I ask for his namesake? Perhaps because I operate a house of prayer. Sometimes people ask me, how do I pray to answer from God? How should I pray to receive answer? And they say, should I pray in tongue? Should I pray loud or quietly? Should I pray in the morning? Or should I fast and pray? Well, all of them works, really. But if I am asked to choose only one aspect of answering prayer, I'll say honestness. In other words, prayer comes from our heart, a deep, deep recess inside of us. I say this from my own experience and also by watching other people's prayer life, that God answers every honest prayer. Along with honest prayer, Bible describes many other aspects of effective prayer that we should strive for. These are those aspects. And I'm not going to go through details today, perhaps some other time. But in a nutshell, it says, praying in faith, having right relationship, and that includes husband honoring wives. I like that. Living righteous and holy life, earnestness or persistence, praying in accordance with the will of God, praying in the name of Jesus, having pure motives and boldness, forgiving others, and praying in agreement and in unity. So these aspects should not be ignored in our prayer lives. Our prayers get hindered when these are lacked in our prayer and our prayer lives, the Bible says. God desires us to be daring like a child in approaching the access to the throne, the access given to us by faith through the work of Jesus on the cross. At the meantime, God also wants us to grow to the full image of our Lord Jesus. That's what this word, audacious, the shameless audacity uh, carries. I would also like to point out uh, that being bold in our prayer is different from having impudent attitude in front of God. There's a good example in the Bible. In Genesis 18, it was when God informed Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham approached God and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away, not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? 
far be it from you for you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous same as the wicked. It's far be it from you. It was a bold approach. But Abraham knew in whose presence he was standing. He acknowledged that he was nothing but a dust and ashes in front of God. And he feared the Lord. He said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. How God responded to Abraham. He bargained with him. And in the end, God saved Abraham's nephew Lot and his family. And Genesis 19 and verse 29 says, when God destroyed those cities, he remembered Abraham and saved Lot out of the catastrophe. This is a very good example of the bold approach that Jesus is talking about in this passage. So going back to the parable, the main point Jesus implies in the parable, actually hidden at the end. And this is what's hidden. I just want to show the, yes, sorry. When you make a bold request, even an average neighbor would get up from the bed at midnight and give you what you need then how much more will your heavenly father respond to your request when you impudently approach him and ask? So this is what's hidden at the end of the parable. So I say to you, Jesus says, ask, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who seeks, receive. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. God is willing to give what you ask. He is ready to give you good gifts. And therefore, do your part by asking, seeking, and knocking. God will do his part. Verse 11. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Some, theolo some theologians have suggested there are a superficial resemblance between these two contrasting items that Jesus mentioned here. So I googled out of curiosity. The picture on the top is the type of fish found in the Sea of Galilee. And the picture at the bottom is the snake living in the region of Palestine. Do they look alike? A little bit. So fathers, when your son asks for a fish, would you give him a snake instead? The one looks really deadly at the bottom. An egg is on the left, and a scorpion is on the right. They say a scorpion looks like, looks like an egg when it curls itself up. I couldn't find such a photo. This is the best I could find. But there are some round shape on the tail, as you can see. It's a bit pathetic, but that's just what it is. So anyway, would you fathers give a scorpion when your son asks for an egg? No one say yes, so I assume you're saying no. Different manuscript has one more sentence in verse 11 about bread versus stone. And because I found photos, I would like to show them to you anyway. The left photo is the bread that first century Jewish people baked and ate. And the right one shows stones in Palestine. Do they look alike? OK, I hear yes now. Oh, sorry, wrong picture. Oops, sorry. Oh, that's scorpion. That's bread. Yeah, OK. 
Do they look alike? I think so. I think they are uh, look alike. So would you give your son stone instead of bread because they look alike? I mean, as long as you know it is a stone, not bread, you will not give it to him, would you? Verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gift to your children. I'm going to pause here for a moment. I know, unfortunately, uh, some fathers seem to give their children snakes or scorpions, causing deep pain in their lives. I don't fully understand the depths of that kind of pain, but I don't take it lightly. I pray for them and pray with them. May God heal their hurt. You may know Lisa Bouvet's story. She runs Messenger International Ministry with her husband, John. She was born with retinoblastoma, which is a very rare form of cancer, and she had to have her eye removed when she was five years old. She grew up being teased as one eye and cyclops. And she also grew up in an emotionally and physically abusive household. Her mother was emotionally violent and her father was an alcoholic. She never knew what she was going to come home to and she never knew what her father was going to come home like. Her parents divorced when she was 12. Then they got back together. Then they were divorced again. Then they married again when they were 14 and then divorced again later. And her father became detached and faded away from her life. She reached she reached her lowest point at her low 20s. But when she met John in university, she became a Christian through him. Since she met her true father, who would never leave her and never forsake her, her life began to turn around. And after she married John, she tried to reach out for her father hoping to reconcile, hoping things could be different. But he didn't respond to her. So one day, she went to visit her father with her husband, John, and their four boys. And they knocked on his door. But she found a note saying, sorry, I changed my mind. I don't want to see you guys. So perhaps, she felt like she received a stone from her father instead of bread. I don't know. But she received comfort from her heavenly father, and she became to understand her father had a pain himself. So Jesus recognized all humans, therefore all human fathers are evil, meaning sinful in their nature. So it is natural for them to give something harmful or something deadly to their child, but they don't. Even though they are sinful human beings, they still give good gifts to their child. Then how much more, Jesus concludes, will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let me read the verse 13 again. If a sinful human father knows how to give good gifts to their children, then how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Are you thrilled at this? Disappointed? Or being puzzled? I mean, I can understand those who are puzzled because Jesus just made a huge logical jump. 
and he's been saying about food all along. Bread, fish, eggs, and all of a sudden, boom, Holy Spirit, and our brain doesn't follow it fast enough. And I can also understand those who are disappointed, and especially when we are praying for something serious, like um, for terminal illness, financial pressure, or family turmoil, we are so desperate to receive a miraculous answer right away. It would be much easier and simpler for Jesus to say that our Father God would answer all our prayers with a miracle, wouldn't it? But he didn't. It's not that Jesus can't or won't, but he just didn't say it that way. But I am thrilled, as many of you would. Why? Because our God who created heaven and earth, both visible and invisible, is a spirit. He gives spiritual gifts as well as physical gifts. That's why he is far, far better than any human neighbors or any human father. And I know the reality that we are facing is not only of the natural realm, but also of the spiritual realm. And our struggle is not against the flesh and blood. It's against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And I know my life doesn't end at my physical death, and I'm destined to live for eternity. And that is the ultimate gift of the Father. God who loves us and cares about us and knows what's best for us gives the best gift to us, Holy Spirit his own spirit, God himself, when we pray. God, who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? He gives the Holy Spirit. I'm going back to Lisa Vivi's story. After that disappointed last visit, he st she stopped expecting her father to be changed any longer. Two decades has passed. But in late 2009, the situation finally changed. She didn't say exactly how, but she went to visit her father with her uh, eldest son. And her father was living in an alcohol-related dementia institution at the time. She saw her father's health and vitality was disappearing. And not knowing what to say, she prayed, Heavenly Father, what do I say? And she heard the Holy Spirit whisper, tell him he was a good dad. No, she said, I'm not going to tell a lie to someone who is facing death. He abandoned me and rejected me. He betrayed my mother with multiple affairs, and he ignored his grandchildren. What's so good about any of this? Then she heard the Holy Spirit whisper again, Lisa. She, he was as good as he knew how to be. Tell him he was a good dad. So at that, she grabbed a hold of his hands and brought it up high so she could have his full attention. And looking straight into his eyes, she said, Dad, you're a good dad. And something amazing happened. 
he started to shake. As if 1,000 volt of electricity shock was going through him. He wept. He cried over her hands. And he said, thank you. The years of anger, guilt, and shame rolled away. And she saw her real father for the first time. And in that holy moment, her son prayed for his grandfather, leading him to eternal life. And he nodded his head, receiving the Christ. That was the last, last time Lisa saw her dad on earth. I said earlier that there are many praying people who are making this church a praying church. You are dead people. I am amazed at your life stories and your testimonies that how you have been and continue to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life journeys. I am truly impressed by those stories. And God is encouraging you today, my brothers and sisters, my children, be bold to approach my throne of grace. I will hear you and answer you. Keep trying to become the person I want you to be. I give you Holy Spirit to comfort you, guide you, and teach you as you pray. Overcome the spiritual forces of evil and succeed in dealing with it in your own life. You are more than conquerors in all these things because I'm on your side. This is God's message to you. I would like to invite a musician to the platform, and I would like to go back to the Lord's Prayer. I would like you to note underlined plural pronouns in the prayer. Jesus gave this as a community prayer. That's what it means. It says we ours and us. So when we pray this together, it reminds us that we have the same spiritual goal for his kingdom and for his righteousness. We have the same spiritual need from physical provision to spiritual protection, we are sharing the same need. So I would like us to pray this prayer together this morning and for the next 100 years and more. Keep handing this prayer over from generation to generation until the kingdom comes completely on us. So I ask you, let's stand up. Are you ready? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sin, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And everyone say out loud, Amen. God bless your church.